everybody, and welcome to the final webinar in Con Masio Carey's 2015 OSHA webinar series. Our topic today is attorney-client privileged investigations and better report writing, conducting better investigations and protecting those findings from disclosure to regulators, plaintiff's attorneys, and others who might have interest. Uh, the faceless voice that you hear right now is Eric Kahn, and I'm joined by my partner, Kate McMahon. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about us, and then we'll dig right into the topic. Uh, I think I recognize just about every name on the list, so hopefully you know who I am already. But very briefly, uh, I am uh, one of the founding partners and chair of the OSHA Workplace Safety Practice Group here at Con Masiel Carey. Uh, my practice and the practice of many of my colleagues in the OSHA practice uh, focuses exclusively on all aspects of OSHA law. We represent employers in inspections, investigations, and enforcement actions involving primarily OSHA and the state uh, OSH program equivalents and some of the other alphabet soup of agencies that get involved in uh, workplace uh, uh, safety and health related incidents like the U.S. Chemical Safety and Hazard Investigation Board, uh, the Mine Safety and Health Administration, EPA, uh, and some state and local agencies that, that also uh, find their way into the mix. Uh, we help employers respond to and manage investigations, which is our topic today, uh, how uh, an attorney can be involved in that process and protect it under privilege uh, and effectively manage uh, an investigation of catastrophic industrial construction and manufacturing workplace accidents, uh, including explosions and chemical releases, and some less than catastrophic incidents as well. Uh, and then, of course, we handle the, uh, all aspects of litigation against OSHA, uh, contesting OSHA citations, including, unfortunately, more often lately than ever before, helping to manage criminal prosecutions and investigations related to OSHA citations as well. I write and speak regularly on safety and health-related topics uh, and conduct safety training, compliance counseling, and audits either directly or with consultants uh, under the attorney-client privilege as well. I'll let Kate introduce herself and we'll jump into our topic. Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to talk to you all again. Um, uh, you know, just very briefly, I think in addition to uh, assisting Eric and our clients uh, in enforcement actions brought by the, uh, by the agency, either federal OSHA or state uh, uh, occupational safety and health agencies, I also have spent a, a fair amount of time over the last 20 or so years um, representing employers and industries, trade associations in really all aspects of agency rulemaking. Um, and as many of you know who have been involved in rules um, that OSHA has promulgated, uh, those it takes quite a long time, um, the lives of some of our children, um, to promulgate a rule. And I have been fortunate enough to be involved, to have been involved in most of the last significant rulemakings that OSHA has uh, undertaken. In addition to that, I've spent a lot of time advising my clients, not in the context of employment, but providing regulatory compliance counseling to assist in development of not only uh, you know, compliant programs, but best practices, um, and internal company programs that go well above and beyond what agency would require under the regulation. So uh, that's a little about me. Uh, why don't we start talking about uh, incident? Yeah, so our topic today, we sort of crammed it all into a very wordy title that covered pretty much everything on the agenda. But just in case there's any mystery behind the title, uh, we're going to talk about uh, how incident investigation reports can be used against employers uh, as sort of a precursor to why you ought to consider uh, to the extent you can conducting your incident investigations under the protection of the attorney-client privilege. We'll talk about why you should do that, how to best do that, and how to avoid waiving the privilege if you have effectively established it. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, effective incident report writing, some things to avoid, uh, how to characterize language to use uh, to convey you know, important findings without setting yourself up for uh, admissions that can be used against you in enforcement actions and civil lawsuits. And then we'll talk about, uh, under a specific umbrella, uh, the OSHA PSM standard and the uh, RMP, uh, EPA's RMP rule that require certain types of incident investigations. We'll talk a little bit about that as a subset of the broader incident investigation topic. So I'm going to let Kate uh, lead us off here. So uh, 
um, you know, the slide in front of you uh, is titled Potential Harmful Impact of Incident Investigation Reports. But before I even talk about, about those, I want to at least mention, and I think we have uh, I want to mention, you know, at the outset, the importance of doing incident reports. If you have an incident at your facility, uh, an actual accident where an employee is injured or a near miss, um, or any anything even out, you know broader than just a health and safety issue, some some incident that concerns you as an employer, it is critically important in our view that you follow up on that. This seminar, this webinar that we're doing here, is not to advise you or encourage you to not do that sort of follow up. We think it's important, it's critical to your business, and what we want to do here is help you do it in a way that allows you to, to allows the process to remain effective for you and your employees, um, but also avoids causing you problems down the road in the form of mainly, primarily admissions, but, you know, other things that will. So, you know, just to sort of specify what I'm talking about in terms of the benefits of an incident uh, investigation and follow-up report, including a written report, is you know, to me, one of the most critical um, uh, benefits of doing an incident investigation in report is to identify root cause to a problem. You have an incident, um, there's, uh, you know, a, a problem getting out a door, you, you, uh, employee gets injured because they can't get through a door, you want to investigate what happened. Was the door malfunctioning? Was there an egress issue? Was there blocked, you know, blocked access to the door, um, you know, was the, were the employees not aware of where the door was? Uh, you want to know that, so you want to do a root cause investigation. That's a huge benefit. Also, um, doing these sorts of investigations, follow-ups of incidents, you can demonstrate the effectiveness of your safety programs. You will run through what was in place that day of that incident and determine which parts of your safety program actually worked and potentially which parts in it and whether there's a regulatory violation or not, what could be done to improve the system so that this sort of incident doesn't happen. Um, so those are some of the benefits of, the, of doing incident reports. What we're going to talk a lot about today, though, is what are the downsides to these incident reports if not done properly and hopefully protected pursuant to the, the, the biggest downside is the obvious one. If these reports are memorialized, if you conduct an in, uh, incident investigation and you put on paper um, the results of those uh, that investigation and you have determined in the course of that investigation that there's some regulatory violation, you have now created a document that can be used against you, against you in a whole slew of contexts. Yeah, most obviously in civil, criminal, um, or administrative litigation. So, you know, we're OSHA lawyers, right? So OSHA can demand those reports and can get those reports in the course of, of an inspection conducted at your facility or follow-up discovery in an uh, administrative action. Similarly, uh, that's the case for EPA. It's also the case for state prosecutors. If, you, uh, if there's any criminal component to or potential uh, for a criminal charge, even if it's not valid, the prosecutors will want to pursue any documents that you have that purport to describe and discuss what happened leading up to that incident and during that incident. There's also potential for civil litigation. If someone was harmed at your, uh, an employee or other uh, person at your facility, there's potential civil litigation. You know, there's worker comp bars, but there are ways around those bars. So um, the, the incident investigation report really becomes the critical document in all those, uh, those follow-up potential litigations. And also, you know, there's media. Um, we, even if there's not any issue related to an administ a litigation, there's the negative um, impact of something you may have written in good faith in your report that showed a lack of diligence, that showed a potential regulatory violation. If that gets out into the press, that could be used against you. Um, so, uh, 
I guess what we want to point out here is that the agencies in administrative litigations and, in fact, in the inspections that the agencies pursue, OSHA and EPA and the CSB and other uh, relevant agencies, they, they have the right to subpoena documents that are in your files, in your possession, unless they are privileged. Privileged documents are exempt from the general discovery rule. So unless they're privileged, um, and the privilege that we're talking about here, really the only pr two privileges relevant here are the attorney-client privilege and the attorney work product privilege. Mostly about the attorney-client privilege, but we'll, we'll at least touch on the work product privilege as well. Um, both of those agencies have the right to subpoena these documents in the context of the inspection or follow-up litigation and or in the context of discovery. And what they use those inspection uh, reports for is basically to build their case. It's a roadmap for them to identify the potential violations that may have been that may have existed at the point of the incident. They also can identify witnesses because you will, if you do a good investigation, you will identify the witnesses to the incident. Um, and um, and, and the report will also likely identify other related documents, programs that were in place, programs that were in place that had potential weaknesses or failures um, that will be noted in your in, in investigation report. So those documents will be, OSHA will look at your report if they have it, and they will, access, they will ask for all of the documents that are referenced that relate to the incident. They will want to interview all of the witnesses who are identified that that were relevant to the incident. The incident report itself will, if there's anything that shows a lack of uh, compliance with the law, will be an admission. Talk about what the federal rules of evidence allow in the context of administrative and civil litigation. Basically, uh, admissions are statements that you know, are harmful to you as the employer, and those doc those admissions are allowed into evidence. Federal, uh, federal rules of evidence that are relied on by OSHRC, the OSHA Review Commission, that um, uh, is, you know, or the, the commission charged with the responsibility for administrative litigations following an OSHA citation. In addition to being an admission, these documents can be used to show an employer's knowledge, right? So you, you, your report says that you had an uh, you know, ASCOM program that did not uh, cover the full gamut of chemicals in your facility. That's in your report. Um, if you have information in that report that shows that Supervisors at your facilities, your managers, knew about the violative condition. That will be used to show employer knowledge. Employer knowledge is a key element of an OSHA violation. In fact, it's probably the element most litigated, or one of the elements most litigated in an uh, administrative uh, litigation following a citation. So, so using that report to show employer knowledge could be critically harmful to you to challenge the citation um, in the context of challenging. It can also, by the way, be used to show willfulness. Now, you know, um, th that's, that's a little more questionable. It depends on what actually is in the, in the report. But if the report shows knowledge, employer knowledge and you did not take action to deal with the noncompliance, that is evidence of willfulness. Certainly evidence the agency would use to try to demonstrate willfulness. Um, so, you know, just to sort of sum up the, the negative uses that these incident reports can be put to that would be harmful to you. Uh, I don't think I've mentioned workers' comp, but in the context of workers' comp, um, as you all probably know, there's an exclusivity bar. So as a, an employee who is harmed at in, on the job can't typically sue its employer. Rather, workers, the workers' comp program um, is uh, relied on to compensate costs. 
for his age. However, the, those are all state laws. Every state has a workers' compensation program and law. And, depend, you know, different states write those laws differently. There are ways to circumvent that bar against bringing an action and in state court by the employee against the employer for that injury. The reports, if they show knowledge of the employer and if they show willfulness of the employer, can certainly be used in many states to circumvent the exclusivity bar of the workers' comp program. And so you could end up with not only an administrative action by OSHA, but an actual civil action by your employee um, if they can get around. Also, the, the um, report, the information in the report can be used by the workers' comp program itself to increase your, um, your rates and affect, you know, affect the, the, the insurer, the audits that are done by the insurer um, that set your rates. So that's, that's another impact, that, uh, ne another negative in impact that can be made of these instances. Criminal, I mentioned that, criminal prosecutions, knowledge, willfulness, the mens rea that is necessary in a criminal action can be demonstrated, at least potentially, if a criminal prosecutor gets a hold of these. Third party litigation, we talked about that. The, a lawsuit by an employee, possibly, if the, if the workers' comp bar is circumvented, or by a third party. Um, you know, oftentimes with a workers' comp bar in place, an employee cannot sue the employer, but it can sue the manufacturer of the equipment that caused the incident, that was involved in the incident. And that, that manufacturer then can third party in the employer. So you get pulled into a lawsuit anyway. Everything in that incident report can be used by that third party as well as, you know, the other people we've been talking about. And just as I mentioned, and as Eric probably has, the media, Dr. Michaels at, the, at OSHA has made a, um, a practice of a, uh, attempting to bring companies into compliance by sort of shaming them. And it's been a pretty effective program that the agency has adopted over there. They've been pretty powerful in their shaming techniques. And, you know, um, so the media is focused more and more on these OSHA press releases that are issued. And anything that the agency gets, the media will get. Anything, at least, that demonstrates the failure of the employer. Okay, just, just a word on the, you know, on the, on the law here. Federal Rule of Evidence 801D2D is the rule that relates to admissions that can be, that, that are admissible in federal court, um, and they are statements by the party's agent or servant concerning a matter within the scope of the agency or employment made during the existence of the relationship. That sort of just, that quintessentially describes, um, you know, the, the writer of this report and the report itself. Um, it falls squarely within the Federal Rule of Evidence 801 and would be considered it in all likelihood. Um, uh, and just FYI, you know, the, as I think I may have mentioned, the OSHA Review Commission has adopted the Federal Rules of Evidence, so that, uh, that identical standard is applicable in, in the OSHA context. Okay, so I've hopefully scared you enough. Um, to uh, pay attention here to this next part. And again, I just want to stress before I go into this, I am, we are not in any way advocating not doing these reports. We think they're critical to your business, to protecting your workers. Um, we, we think that they are best done under the, under the auspices of the attorney-client privilege. And, and I guess just as a, you know, sort of a broad precursor note to that, a lot of what we're going to talk about today talks about techniques that you can employ to ensure that the attorney-client privilege is in place in doing these reports. Well, I, I want to stress that this isn't, you know, we're not talking about shams here. I don't, I don't, I don't recommend that. I don't recommend, um, you know, trying to privilege a report that is not otherwise privileged. What we're talking about here is how you actually create a privileged investigation, conduct a privileged investigation, and create a privileged report, not trick to, you know, do some sham thing where you're pretending that it's privileged, but it's not. 
Um, so, so what is the attorney-client privilege? The attorney-client privilege is a privilege, as I mentioned sort of at the outset, that is an exception to the otherwise broad uh, ability that courts allow of parties who are litigating to get relevant documents or relevant information in the context of a lawsuit. Courts support broad discovery um, so that parties can prove their case or defend themselves. Party client privilege is an absolute exception to that broad discovery principle that you will find across the board, administrative litigation, federal court civil litigation, and to some extent. Um, the privilege is, as I said, it's absolute. If it applies, it cannot be violated. If it is kept in place, it is absolute. Unlike the attorney work product privilege, which is another privilege we'll at least touch on here, that is a qualified privilege. That means that even though the, uh, a document may fall within the attorney work product privilege, it could nonetheless be discoverable if uh, the opposing party, the party that wants to get the document, can demonstrate a true need for it in order to, say, defend its case. It's the only place anywhere, um, the only place that that party can get this information. Courts will make a determination about whether the need is great enough to overcome the, the existing work product privilege. That will not be the case with the attorney-client uh, privilege. Um, the second thing I'll tell you just at the outset here on talking about the privilege is just generally where privilege claims are litigated. Privilege, can, you know, what happens often is someone will claim that a document is privileged, so therefore they will not turn it over in the context of discovery or in the OSHA context in the context of an ongoing inspection. They will tell the government about it in a privilege log and say, we're, we're not providing this, this is the document, and it's privileged. Um, the government then may challenge the uh, existence of that privilege, and that itself will be litigated. Typically, uh, in federal court litigation, that will be done under federal common law on privilege. So there's a whole body of law that has grown up through cases in federal court, and the determination of whether that particular document will be privileged or not in, in a federal question, um, in, a, in a case that is over a federal question, like an OSH, OSH Act appeal, for instance, will be determined based on federal common law. If this is a state court suit, obviously it's going to be determined uh, uh, based on state, you know, the state law of privilege in the, in the relevant state. And there's all kinds of choice of law questions that we won't get into here today. Um, the third sort of category on the civil side would be where you're in federal court, but you're there based on diversity jurisdiction. Uh, that is where there are two parties in two different states, and so you get to federal court that way. And in that context, privilege litigation will occur, privilege challenges will usually apply the state law as opposed to the federal common law. Okay, the elements of the attorney-client privilege. Basically, there are four key elements. The first and most fundamental is the attorney-client privilege protects communication. That's what it protects, okay? It's different, the work product uh, privilege is different. It protects documents that lawyers generate in anticipation of, you know, representing their client in a litigation or in an ongoing litigation. This protects the communication between an attorney and his client or an attorney's agent and his client. And we'll talk about that. That's critical probably to why a lot of you are on the telephone today. Um, so it's a communication. It's between the client uh, and the client's attorney or his agent. It's made in confidence. That's the, another critical component, essential component to the It's got to be confidential got to be something that is not broadcast publicly. Doesn't mean it's only two people or three people that know this, that are, you know, share this information, 
but the confidence has to be maintained, and we'll talk about that in a few. The final critical element of attorney-client privilege is that it, the communication that is confidential is made for a very specific purpose, seeking legal advice or the attorney providing legal advice. It is not for communications between an attorney and a client, whatever their purpose, including, most relevant to our discussion today, some business purpose, some valid business purpose, but not a legal purpose. And much of the law, the litigation surrounding attorney-client privilege, turns on this question of whether the, at least in the context that we think about when we're doing incident reports, turns on whether um, a lawyer was involved truly in order to provide legal advice or to provide business advice. That question is most pointed in the context of in-house counsel as opposed to outside counsel. So, you know, this is where the rubber meets the road, right? This is why we're probably all on the phone today. What we want to talk about is the typical situation where some one of you has an incident um, or is looking into some potential compliance issue. Eric's going to talk specifically about in the context of process safety management. Um, and you want to, you, you, the lawyer, and you, the client, cannot do this by yourselves, or you would be greatly benefited by the involvement of a technical assistant. Slew of consultants out there that have huge expertise in the area of your uh, processes, your operations, your business. We're lawyers, and we have a lot of expertise, and we think we have expertise in everything, but we don't always, and we need help sometimes. Under certain conditions, we are able to employ a technical expert, a scientist, someone who's got expertise in PSM or expertise in HASCOM, someone who is not within our law firm and not at your client, within your client's company, who can benefit the investigation. And we can employ that person and have them help us develop, uh, do the investigation and develop the incident report that can be used by your company to you know, change your systems or improve your systems. Um, however, there are limits on when the use of that consultant will um, be allowed and the privilege still retained, and when use of that consultant will render the privilege unavailable. Essentially, you know, the way I like to think about it when I'm hiring experts is, the, the entity, the consultant, is, first of all, it's my consultant who, uh, who I've retained. Um, even if it's someone who the client regularly retains for other purposes, um, even relevant and related purposes. But this incident that has occurred, I want to know, as your counsel, I want to investigate this. I want to figure out what happened, whether there were compliance issues. I need the help of an expert. I retain the expert, and then that expert essentially serves as you know, a wing of me, an, an extension of the attorney, um, uh, the attorney conducting the investigation. Um, okay, so here's some guidelines in the context of the, the technical experts that I just mentioned. It's best, doesn't always happen this way, but it really is best if you're really trying to keep this uh, investigation privileged and any report generated there from privileged that especially if the consultant is going to be involved in writing the report to have the consultant retained by counsel in in-house counsel or outside counsel. Second, the consultant should interface with the client through the attorney. Now there's you know there's lots of um, discussions that we can have surrounding that that this is not to say that there cannot ever be communications between the consultant and the company's employees without the attorney present. In fact, often there are site investigations that are conducted by the consultant where the attorney is not physically present um, and not involved in every step of the process. Uh, but generally, you know, the way you ought to think about this is the, the consultant is interfacing through the attorney, even if he's not there. He ought to be taking direction from the attorney and then using that direction to communicate with the client. 
um, and scoping out the project through the advice that the attorney has given him that the attorney needs in order to render. Um, therefore, the consultant shouldn't simply be turned loose, you know, to interview um, the client, to work with the client without, you know, it's pretty direct counsel uh, involvement and oversight. Um, specifically, um, the consultant, if, uh, if there's going to be a consultant who is doing a physical examination of the equipment or of the a walkthrough of the facility to assess compliance, our strong recommendation, there's lots of, there's a number of cases that have looked at this question. Um, our strong recommendation is that that employee, uh, excuse me, that consultant be directed by the company's employees, not just sort of sent into the facility without an employee of the client being sort of side by side and directing that comp that uh, that consultant. And the consultant should basically not independently collect information. All right. <clears throat> At the end of the process with your forensic expert, technical expert, or consultant, uh, there is most likely going to be a report uh, prepared. Uh, there doesn't always have to be. In fact, one of the things we often will do with a technical expert will be to have the expert uh, convey his findings, recommendations, thoughts, conclusions about an incident to us verbally uh, that we can use with our incident investigation team to prepare a report or just to take those learnings and act on them without having a written report. But typically there will be some written work product. You know, often these are very complex uh, investigations that you can't just deliver a verbal communication about those findings. But if you're going to uh, have the technical expert put together some written work product, that written work product should be delivered to the attorney, uh, not to the attorney's client. Uh, it should be conveyed to or through the attorney to maintain the attorney-client privilege because his work is being done at the attorney's direction, not the company's direction. Uh, and then, you know, that report should be delivered in draft form. Uh, it should have all the right markings and labelings uh, prepared at the direction of counsel, attorney-client privilege, attorney work product. All that fun stuff should be on every page uh, and should be delivered to the attorney to either review and finalize or to review and incorporate into the legal advice that the attorney is going to be delivering. Let's review here just some final uh, tips about conducting attorney-client privilege investigations, uh, and then we'll get into um, you know, how, how that privilege may be waived, and then the effective report writing itself. Uh, tips for conducting privileged investigations. Uh, first thing you should do is document that the investigation is being conducted at the direction of counsel, either in-house or outside counsel. There's sort of a seminal Supreme Court case out there called uh, Upjohn um, is the, is the you know, name of the case, the caption of the case. And we often refer to putting together an Upjohn package or an Upjohn memoranda or set of Upjohn memoranda. What we typically do to get an initial um, uh, investigation started under attorney-client privilege is put together a memo <clears throat> from a senior executive at the company, a memo that is directed from that senior executive to me as outside counsel or to the general counsel within the company or some in-house in counsel directing that that attorney conduct an investigation into the incident so that the attorney can provide legal advice to the company about the status of compliance or any compliance issues, regulatory or legal uh, issues uh, that may be related to that incident. And then what we also typically do is send another memo from the senior executive to the site team. If this is a petroleum refinery, a manufacturing facility, you send it to that particular facility's local management, uh, communicating to them that the company has engaged counsel to conduct a privileged investigation so that the attorneys can provide legal advice and directing the local management team to cooperate with the counsel who will be conducting the investigation and also providing tips about how to maintain privilege, that this must be done in confidence, uh, we can't share the information outside the control group within the company, and that all of the information should be provided to or through counsel uh, for purpose of the investigation. So you want to document from the outset 
that the investigation is being done at the direction of counsel for the purpose of soliciting legal advice. Again, specifying that the primary purpose is to secure uh, legal advice for the company. Label all the documents during the uh, incident investigation, whether it's your field notes, and you may have uh, you know, employees participating in the investigation team with counsel uh, taking notes out in the field or having the technical or forensic experts uh, take notes or document findings and observations. You're going to take photographs and uh, you know, download those onto a computer uh, for the investigation team review. Drafts of a report. Um, uh, draft, you know, you've got all sorts of root cause trees and analyses and matrix. All of those records, every page of all of those records should be identified as attorney-client privilege prepared at the direction of counsel. Uh, you know, that, that moniker does not necessarily need to exist on the page for the document to be uh, protected as privileged, but it sure helps when you're reviewing your uh, files to produce to an agency or to produce in a civil uh, litigation context. It's going to jump out, hey, this page is labeled as privileged. I need to take a closer look at this and make sure it is privileged. And it also helps establish privilege by demonstrating to a judge that it intended for this to be privileged when we created it, and we also maintained it in confidence. And by putting this label on there was another way for us to protect uh, disclosure of this record to the public, uh, therefore protecting its confidentiality and maintaining privilege. So it's important to label things effectively during the investigation. Control who's part of the investigation. You want this to really be uh, the control group within the organization, those folks who have a need to know or who have a special expertise or knowledge that is necessary uh, to conduct an effective investigation. And the smaller you can keep that circle, the more likely you are to maintain confidentiality and, and best effectively protect the attorney-client privilege. Uh, address the written report. Um, if this is coming from a, a, you know, a technical expert, their report should be addressed to counsel, not to the company. And if it is um, you know, a report that's being prepared by counsel or by an investigation team being directed by counsel, uh, the author of the report ought to be identified as that counsel, say um, all the language we've talked about above. Record efforts you've taken to maintain confidentiality and to preserve privilege. If you're maintaining records in a um, you know, password protected uh, intranet or, or database, uh, you know, document all the steps that you've taken to do that. Uh, and that's another a good step that you can take is to preserve things in an area that is not accessible uh, by employees, uh, general employee population or others outside the general employee population, certainly non-employees in particular. Uh, keep privileged records separate from non-privileged records, you know, talking about this secure database or if there's not, you know, if that's a technology you don't have, keeping them separately in hard copy in a special um, uh, separate set of files uh, for, for things that are not going to be accessible to those outside the control group. <clears throat> and then carefully circulate privileged documents to only those who have a need to know within the control group. And we'll talk a little bit um, about you know, how you can take advantage of the, the findings and the lessons learned and the recommendations without waiving privilege. And one of the things, one of the big struggles we often see is you know, a recommendation came out of this investigation that we should install some special new um, uh, you know, fire protection equipment or emergency response equipment. Uh, or, or some additional, you know, valves or other engineering control to avoid this incident in the future. Well, how do we get this out for bid? How do we get this out to a contractor? How do we convey to a contractor what we need done at our plant without waiving privilege? And you can do that several ways. One is you don't share the report with your contractor or the construction entity or the engineering firm. You just convey the assignment to them. I want a you know, a new valve at this location, and I want the valve to be of this specification. You don't say why. You don't say it's the result of an incident investigation that recommended it. You don't say that we're doing it because we believe it will prevent this future consequence. You just say, factually speaking, this is the product that we want, the service that we want, where we want it done, uh, without, you know, providing language from the incident investigation report or you know, the origin of the assignment being from an investigation report. I think that's an effective way to communicate 
to someone outside your control group without waiving attorney-client privilege. Uh, one little sub-issue that comes up here, and I see we've got a lot of in-house counsel on this call today. One of the issues that we have seen come up in a lot of privilege cases is that uh, investigation or an audit that's been done at the direction of in-house counsel uh, where the privilege has been lost uh, or at least challenged, um, vigorously challenged by government or plaintiff's attorneys, uh, making the argument that certainly these folks are attorneys, they provide legal advice to their client, which is the executive team for their company, but often folks in an in-house capacity wear dual hats. And you know they always talk about it in the context of your headwear, but the concept being that you are uh, both an attorney for the company and often a business executive. And your participation in decision making and activities like audits, uh, investigations, or just general decisions uh, with the company uh, can take either a legal role or a business role. And that is really scrutinized. And they'll look at that and say, what's the normal process here? Do we do these types of audits all the time? Uh, does this person participate in events like this all the time, not just for the delivery of legal advice? And it is much easier to scrutinize an in-house an in-house counsel's role um, as potentially a business role rather than a legal role, a lot easier than it is to characterize an outside counsel's role as a business role. Uh, when you bring in outside counsel, it is you know almost universally uh, for the purpose of providing a legal service and not a dual legal and business service. So we have seen that there is a lot, a lot stronger um, uh, defense of attorney-client privilege when outside counsel are involved when, uh, rather than just in-house counsel. Certainly in-house counsel are capable of doing all the same things that outside counsel are. You just need to be more careful in documenting uh, the purpose of the investigation and the role that the in-house counsel is playing uh, to best protect privilege when you're using in-house counsel or get outside counsel involved because that is uh, not scrutinized at the same level. Waiver of the privilege, something to be careful if you've est effectively established privilege, effectively conducted the investigation to maintain privilege, finalized the report, you've got a good quality report that's protected by privilege, you can waive that after the fact. And a lot of you know, ways that you can, can waive the privilege, uh, and, and mainly that is by sharing it with folks outside the control group and for purposes other than the delivery of legal advice. Waiver might mean you have voluntarily disclosed the report or the findings from the report to the uh, government investigator, to um, you know a contractor or engineering firm like we talked about before, or to you know all, all employees within your company, uh, many of whom are outside the control group. Uh, voluntary disclosure will waive the privilege for all purposes going forward. Inadvertent disclosure can also waive privilege. So if you accidentally include the report in a you know, banker box full of documents you're producing to OSHA during an OSHA inspection, you didn't realize it was in there, but it slipped in there, uh, there are pr procedures and you know, rules of evidence and procedure that will allow you to try to claw that back and continue to maintain privilege. But there are a lot of jurisdictions out there that say an inadvertent disclosure uh, is just as good as a voluntary disclosure for purposes of waiving privilege. Uh, another reason why it's important to label uh, all of the documents as privileged so you will catch that, you're less likely to inadvertently disclose, and also to maintain them in a separate, uh, you know, a separate location from your non-privileged documents, making it less likely that you would inadvertently disclose. Selective disclosure can also result in waiver of privilege. For example, you conduct an incident investigation and you know 90% of the findings are really helpful. Uh, they support your defenses to an OSHA violation. So you start plucking out of the investigation report that, hey, we conducted an investigation. We had an expert look at this and he reached all these conclusions that you're wrong about this, 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 and this, OSHA. So our, you know, our investigation shows that these violations are wrong. OSHA is going to have a very strong argument to make to the judge that, hey, you can't just pick these findings to show that we were wrong about these violations and try to protect the 10% of the report that shows admissions or shows the uh, existence of some other violation uh, and will likely have to turn that over. So you've got to be careful when you make a decision to disclose any part of an investigation that you are likely opening the door to producing the entire investigation. So think about you know, whether strategically that makes sense. 
uh, once a privilege is waived, it's, it's waived forever. It can't go back in the box. Um, but at the same time I make that statement, um, I'm not sure if Kate mentioned this in the first half, um, uh, one of the things I always recommend doing these things under privilege when you can, because you can always waive the privilege, but you can't retroactively apply it. So if you say, just not worried about it, go out and do an investigation, we'll get the consultant, we'll see what he has to say, and then he comes back with findings that are very, very damaging, you can't at that point stuff it into a privilege box and try and protect it going forward. You've lost that opportunity. But you can always waive the privilege, and you can always waive the privilege in a way that uh, doesn't convey that it was ever done under privilege. You just produce it and say, here's the investigation report uh, that we did. Here's the final report. And if you've decided in advance you're going to waive it, you can remove all of the attorney-client privilege monikers and labels from it, and it's just your investigation report. Here it is. So I think it's a smart thing to do to at least consider before you dig in and start an investigation, do it under privilege because there's always the opportunity to waive it later, uh, but you can't apply it retroactively. And once it's waived, it's waived forever. Um, another thing to think about is this subject matter waiver concept that if you waive it for any reason, um, it is waived for all all reasons on that same subject matter. So in other words, if you, taking the contractor or engineering firm example, if you do the investigation under privilege and you share a copy of that report with an engineering firm or a contractor to say, look, you know, this report recommended that we install valves here, here, and here, and a water curtain there, and change this uh, design con configuration to best protect employees from this hazard. Uh, so here's the report, go design these things for us. You've waived the privilege at that point. If you're sharing the report, the findings, the logic behind the recommendations, you've waived the um, privilege for that subject matter. So now if the government comes around, OSHA, EPA, uh, whoever, and asks for a copy of the report in their investigation or their inspection, you can't claim that it's privilege that you could try. Uh, you would have a, a very weak privilege claim because you have waived the privilege as to that subject matter when you produced it to the contractor. So it's a subject matter waiver once it's waived. All of the subject matter related to that investigation and the findings are waived for all purposes. All right, so now we'll get into effective incident report writing. Uh, and this sort of section of the presentation <clears throat> applies whether you're doing a, a privileged or a non-privileged investigation. In fact, it applies even more if you're doing an investigation that's not privileged. And the idea here is being careful and thoughtful about the words you use um, because th this report is likely to be used against you in any number of the ways that Kate talked about in the first half of the presentation. So think about how you write the report, A, to convey the most useful information to your internal team or your outside contractors to learn from this and implement findings to prevent the incident from happening again, but also recognizing that OSHA, EPA, plaintiff's attorneys, the media, uh, your union, whoever it is, they're going to get their hands on it. So you need to be thoughtful about how you're crafting the final report uh, for the investigation. This is my just sort of general recommendation for how you structure a report. There really is not a one-size-fits-all. Some reports uh, may not be full root cause investigation reports. Uh, some, it may not make sense to include uh, certain of these elements, but if you've got a meaningful incident, uh, you're doing a root cause investigation, this is the structure that I generally recommend for a report. I start off with an executive summary, preferably a one-pager, no more than one page, where I lay out very briefly summary of events, consequences, causes, and recommendations. Uh, right up front, uh, often that's all that your executive team is going to read. Um, this is a great summary of the incident for those that uh, are not going to dig in and look at the full, you know, 20, 30, 50, 100 page report. Uh, if you can have an executive summary, that's valuable for your senior leadership team. Then we dig in and we take all of those things that I just recommended having in an executive summary and have a full section of your report uh, on those topics. Background. Describe the process, the manufacturing process, the chemical process, uh, the construction uh, uh, activity you're engaged in, whatever it is, describe the process. What was, you know, what was the intended manufacturing process happening at the time? 
uh, describe the purpose and scope of the investigation and the conditions that preceded the incident. You know, describe the weather that day, uh, time of day things happened and what was happening prior to the incident itself. Uh, and then as a narrative, a separate section, describing the incident itself. What happened step by step, event scenario, sequence, consequences, and often, sometimes it makes sense also to include the response uh, in this section of the investigation report if the response is something, the emergency response is something that you've also covered in your investigation. And then a separate section on contributing factors and root causes, identifying and discussing the root causes, the contributing factors of the incident, what are they, uh, and in what way did they contribute to or did they cause the incident. Separate section on findings and recommendations, and I think these ought to be really broken down as separate, you know, either separate sections or separate parts of this section. A finding is different from a recommendation. Uh, a finding, you know, in a lot of ways is tied to that root cause, and many, in many instances that is the finding. The root cause and the findings might be the same thing. Uh, and then separately identifying recommendations for future action or future engineering controls uh, or administrative controls uh, to protect against this type of incident from happening again. Uh, and then in other, this doesn't necessarily just stick at the end of the process, other, you might incorporate many of these things throughout the report, but you consider including in your report backup information, data, uh, you know, uh, if you've got a DCS control system uh, to show the data that you're reporting about, that alarm sounded at this time or that, you know, a runaway reaction began at this point, include the data that shows that. Um, consider discussing uh, other incident uh, causes or contributing factors that you considered and rejected. Uh, I think that's very helpful to show often, uh, especially if you think OSHA is going to reach some conclusions about violations um, of their regulations, that you consider those scenarios and were able to reject or rule those out. Uh, it's a good sort of defensive way, proactive defensive way of ruling out things that you think OSHA or civil attorneys may address if your, if your investigation has honestly ruled out uh, those findings. Uh, you could consider including that in your report. <clears throat> uh, key documents you may want to identify and perhaps append or attach those to the report. Um, you want to define the method of investigation. There's lots of different uh, methodologies out there, root cause uh, uh, investigations by a million different names, a million different processes. Uh, describe the process that you followed, identified, uh, identify the team members uh, and perhaps even their specialty, their unique knowledge, uh, that, that, you know, the reason why they were on the team. Uh, you, you may or I would say should include photographs that are relevant to the investigation and the findings, diagrams, calculations, lab reports, anything that supports the conclusions that you've reached, uh, consider including those in the report uh, as support. Now thinking about how we communicate all of those things. How do we write effectively about our findings and recommendations without getting ourselves in a lot of trouble? We've got a list of do's and don'ts here. Uh, the do's, even if you've done this uh, investigation under attorney-client privilege and even if OSHA hasn't shown up to start an inspection and even if there's no demand letter from a plaintiff's attorney while you're conducting the investigation, assume that the report will become a public document. Every time you are putting pen to paper and writing something that's going in this report, think about it from that perspective. This document will be public. How do I want to write this with the understanding that this document will be a public document? Limit the use of abbreviations and acronyms that uh, you know, are not common knowledge throughout the public, uh, things that could be uh, confusing or mislead a reader uh, because they don't understand what the abbreviation or acronym means. Um, like I said, use photos, figures, and tables to support your findings. Stick to the facts. You know, I've got this under do's. Stick to the facts. Under don'ts, you'll see don't speculate, don't guess, don't assume. Stick to the facts. Very critical piece here. This should be a very factual report without assumptions, without speculation, without guesses. If you don't know something, if your investigation was not able uh, to conclude that something did contribute or cause the incident, I think it's appropriate to, to leave that out of the report because it's not a fact uh, that you've been able to establish. Use a neutral tone. Um, you know, we see a lot of reports out there with damning language like, you know, the supervisor failed to take this action, 
Um, you know, if we don't take this additional action, it's going to cause catastrophic consequences. Try to use a neutral tone, again, sort of sticking to the facts, state the facts as facts without, you know, inflammatory language, without exaggeration, without overstating, just simple neutral tone. <clears throat> um, describe the concerns carefully, and when I say carefully, I'm thinking back to the idea that this is a document that the government will have, plaintiffs will have, the union will have. Be careful how you describe concerns. You don't want to leave concerns out because it's important to, you know, that's why you do the investigation. You want to identify the, um, the areas of concern that need to be addressed, but do it in a careful way. And when I say careful way, I'm thinking about um, avoiding language that sounds like admissions, avoiding language that ties this uh, directly to violations of the law, and, uh, and avoiding language that, that can be used by OSHA to do all those bad things Kate talked about, like establishing knowledge, establishing willfulness, admitting to a violation. Draft thoughtful, practical recommendations. Key there is practical recommendations. So often we see folks put in an incident investigation report a recommendation that is not feasible at all and maybe even known by the investigators to not be feasible, but it's sort of the wish list type of action. If you don't think it's a practical recommendation that can be accomplished by your company, don't include it as a recommendation in the report because putting a recommendation in that you know cannot or will not be implemented is setting you up for all sorts of future bad consequences. Investigation, recommend something, the action's not taking, and another incident occurs in the future, that report's gonna be used against you to prove knowledge, willfulness. You knew about it, you knew what could have prevented it, and you didn't take that step. Well, if there is, not, if there is something that cannot be done, you know, so you know it's not gonna be done, I wouldn't include it as a recommendation. Maybe it's something you talk about uh, offline with the control group, uh, but without including it in the investigation report. Use good professional judgment as it applies to all of this, language that you use, recommendations that you make, so on and so forth. <clears throat> don'ts. Uh, more do's. I guess there's more do's to consider here before we get to the don'ts. Uh, do use past tense rather than present tense. Uh, we see that very often. We want to leave room for the idea that by the time somebody's looking at this report, we are doing things differently. This should always be about past tense, what was happening at the time of the incident or prior to the incident. Uh, consider mitigating factors before you make uh, recommendations. You know, just like a uh, process hazard analysis in the PSM context, think about what's already in place before you recommend something. If it's not really a contributing factor because there was adequate mitigating factors already, you know, it, it's not something you need to recommend. Um, and, and consider including a discussion of those in the report. Uh, identify what those mitigating factors were that already exist and incorporate that into the findings of the report or the narrative description of the report. Uh, determine whether a safety rule was violated. This is very important. It, it's very important to do this carefully because there is nothing that offends uh, OSHA and offends your union more than blaming the employee, but often that's the, that's the reality. There is a you know, safety rule or an operational procedure that was violated with no good explanation uh, and no good reason to do it, uh, contrary to very effective training and very effective written operating procedures or safety rules. You need to identify that. You need to determine whether it happened, and you need to identify it in your report. But next bullet, tread very lightly in how you describe that misconduct. You need to put it in there because you need to preserve that defense if you've got a, you know, an OSHA violation to deal with or a civil lawsuit to deal with. Uh, but you don't want to, you know, overstate it, overemphasize it, highlight it, identify it as the only finding, uh, the only cause, unless it is. Uh, but if you can find ways to sort of just include it in the mix without highlighting it, um, you, you can, in that instance, perhaps avoid inflaming OSHA who looks at employers and says, oh, look, they just, just blame me and the employee again. Uh, let's try and you know, bring the hammer down on them. You've got to preserve the defense if it's real, and if there was a safety rule or an operational procedure that was violated, just don't overstate it. Tread lightly in that area. Um, uh, you know, think about an, a realistic implementation plan. Often your investigation report will set forth a calendar or a schedule. You know, install these valves within 30 days. Uh, make sure that what you're putting out is realistic. 
because if you set a schedule and you don't meet it, that's going to be used against you by OSHA. Uh, certainly in the process safety management standpoint, we'll talk about a little bit where you have a duty to set forward recommendations with a schedule to implement them. Don't meet your schedule <clears throat> that you by OSHA as a violation. The same is true outside of PSM as well. Uh, if you're dealing with a future incident uh, or, or you know, just in a general compliance context, you've made a recommendation, you set a schedule for yourself and you didn't meet it, that's going to be used against you perhaps even to establish willfulness, that you knew about something and just deliberately uh, did not bring yourself into compliance. Think about how the report's going to be used against you. Again, just thinking about the publicity of the report, how it can be used against you in all these contexts whenever you're putting pen to paper. And I, you know, I say consider here, I recommend in almost every circumstance that you seek legal review before you finalize an incident investigation. But certainly if it's done under privilege, uh, that it's a mandatory uh, element of the process. But even if it wasn't done under privilege, consider having attorneys in-house or outside counsel review the report before it's finalized because they can give you some good ideas about how this report may, uh, may be used against you and ways you could rewrite things to avoid that. The don'ts, I think a, a lot of these don'ts are intuitive based on the do's that we just discussed. But, you know, again, don't speculate. Don't overstate, don't assume, don't exaggerate or oversimplify. Uh, all of these are ways to you know, get yourself in some trouble in the OSHA context or in civil litigation that you have um, you know, set yourself up for an admission of a violation or to make it sound like uh, you know, something was very simple to avoid and you didn't take very basic steps to do that, um, you know, set you up for uh, willfulness, things like that. Uh, do not admit to a legal or regulatory violation. You can talk about root causes without linking them to a, a regulatory requirement. You know, I see in investigation reports all the time, you know, did not develop an operating procedure consistent with 1910, 119, et cetera, et cetera. There's no reason in your report to link something to a regulatory requirement. You can say things like operating procedure, um, you know, could have been written in more detail around this area. Uh, operating procedure could have more effectively conveyed this, you know, detailed part of the process without saying operating procedure uh, was inadequate, you know, did not comply with the standard operating procedure requirements of PSM standard. Your, your incident investigation report is not about regulatory compliance. It's about the incident, the causes of the incident, and ways to avoid it. So there's no reason to link it to a regulatory violation and certainly no reason to admit to a violation in the report. You can talk about how things could have been done better and ways to improve them without acknowledging that it was a violation of the law. Uh, I would not recommend including in an incident investigation report discussion of prior incidents that are similar in nature. Uh, you can learn from those incidents and, and, and review those incident reports as you're conducting your investigation, but I would recommend against identifying them in the report. That gives the reader of the report, if it's an, a government investigator or plaintiff's attorney, something to go ask about uh, to get some additional information to identify that you had prior knowledge, you knew about it, should have done something more, uh, including those discussions will, will not be helpful to you. Uh, I would rec strongly recommend against um, talking about in your investigation report any discussion about money, uh, about cost or spending decisions. You know, this incident could have been avoided if management had just ponied up the additional money for additional uh, valves or, you know, additional engineering controls, et cetera, et cetera. You can say, uh, so, you know, that <clears throat> the lack of a, you know, control valve at this location in the process contributed to the incident without saying management decided to not spend money or it was too expensive to install it. Uh, and I would never recommend discussing money, cost, or spending decisions in a report. Uh, likewise, I wouldn't discuss failures to act or delay. Uh, you can point out that, you know, there was a valve, uh, a valve was not in that location that could have caused the incident without saying somebody failed to install a valve or somebody was sitting on somebody's desks and they waited too long to, to get the engineering going on that. Uh, no need to include that sort of background expl explanation. You can just say this valve wasn't there and would have helped uh, avoid this incident without, you know, laying it at the, at the feet of someone. Uh, 
or failing to act or delay. Don't characterize conduct. You know, you don't need to say that someone's conduct was improper, inadequate, grossly negligent, things like that. You can just describe the conduct, what was done, and how it may have contributed to the incident without characterizing it in one of these negative or violative ways. Uh, you know, try to avoid predicting outcomes of, of future inaction when you make your recommendations. You know, recommendation uh, will help avoid similar incidents in the future rather than saying, you know, implementation of this recommendation will avoid, you know, catastrophic incidents, will avoid major property damage, will avoid deaths of employees. That sort of inflammatory uh, language, you know, not necessary. You've made the recommendation, you've set a deadline for it, just stick to the facts, avoid this sort of inflammatory language. And then as a last step, you know, this goes along with what I've been saying all along, uh, don't, you know, don't write anything that you wouldn't want to read in the newspaper. Assume it will be public, assume the public will have access to it, assume it's going to show up as a headline in your local newspaper, so don't write anything that you wouldn't want to see in that headline of your local newspaper. Uh, and as a last topic here, just want to briefly review, there are standards out there like process safety management, like uh, EPA's RMP rule that require incident investigations. In those incidents, it's very difficult to establish privilege uh, or, or to maintain privilege if it's something you're required to do and required to produce to the agency, at least if they ask for it. Um, however, what we have done very effectively, and this is one of those incidents, incidents that caused or could have resulted in a catastrophic release of a highly hazardous chemical, you are required under the PSM standard and the RMP rule to initiate an incident investigation. You're required to initiate it within 48 hours, to establish a team of experts, uh, internal or outside, and prepare a report at the conclusion of that investigation. It is, I don't think there is an effective way to make that report uh, attorney-client privileged. However, if you look at what's required by OSHA in a PSM incident report, it's a pretty generic, pretty general shell of an investigation. This is all that's required to be included in a PSM required incident investigation report. The date of the incident, the date when the invest investigation began, a description of the incident, your contributing factors, and your recommendations. That's not nothing, but you can produce a report that is limited to just those topics for compliance reasons, and then in parallel, establish a separate attorney-client privileged investigation that dives much deeper, that provides much more of the detail that we talked about before with you know, all of the narrative of the incident, the, the, the events that led up to the incident, your findings, your recommendations, uh, all of this additional information beyond what's minimally required in the PSM report. Do that separately under attorney-client privilege for the purposes of obtaining legal advice from counsel. So you can do two investigations of the same incident, one for compliance purposes and one for legal advice, and protect that other report that you may include more sensitive information in that is not uh, required in the minimum requirement. That's something to think about uh, as you're considering um, incident investigations in, in areas involving highly hazardous chemicals covered by PSM, EPA, or other uh, OSHA standards that require investigations as well. That was our topic for today, the final topic in the 2015 webinar series. Uh, I would encourage you all to take a look at our OSHA Defense Report blog, launched in September, already populated. I think we've got at least 20 articles uh, up there now, and you know, please check it out. I'd love to know that someone other than my mother is reading it. Um, and uh, you know, take a look, and if there's topics that you think we should be writing about that we're not, send me a note and make recommendations. Uh, you'll also find on the blog uh, the archive of all of the um, all of the webinars that we've done, uh, links to those with recordings and, and, and slides and all that good stuff, uh, so you can access all of the 2015 webinars uh, through the blog as well. And with that, I will open it up to some questions and see if we've got anything here already in the queue. And if you have questions, uh, just uh, type those into the chat box. Uh, should be on the bottom left corner. Um, we'll try to address that. Well, I 
think we must have just described things so effectively that uh, there are no questions. That's always a good sign. <laughs> or you're all asleep at your desks. And if that's the case, I apologize for that. Uh, in any event, <clears throat> if you think of anything to, to talk about or questions that you have after today, um, you know, I've told you this before, or if, you, uh, if we haven't met before uh, and you just heard me today, hopefully you can tell I'm a big OSHA nerd. I love this stuff. I love talking about it. I love hearing your experiences with the agency or experiences with the topics that we're discussing here. So don't ever hesitate to contact Kate or me. Uh, here's our contact information, email or phone, uh, and let us know what's going on at your workplace. Um, uh, if, you, you know, if you've got questions or uh, just want to talk about something interesting, uh, please reach out. Uh, this, was, uh, this was enjoyable, a fun year. I think we did eight of these webinars this year. The schedule you'll see coming out for 2016, I think, is going to have one a month. So we'll be doing at least 12 of these next year uh, and really looking forward to that as well. Thanks, you all, for joining us today and throughout the year for these webinars. Again, this is sort of the close of the first full year of my law firm, and this has been a lot of fun both in this webinar process but just in general uh, working with you all, partnering with you on uh, cases and, and, uh, and helping to advance the cause of workplace safety. Um, thank you all, and have a wonderful end of the year. Happy holidays and happy new year. Thank you. Please stand by.